Hey everybody, welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today we're wrapping up season three. I love wrapping up these seasons because it gives us a chance to look at the season as a whole, and season three has a whole lot to look at. So in prep for this video, I watched all of season three in the last two days. Vacation was awesome. There's so much to talk about for one of the best seasons of television, in my opinion. As such, this video might be a little bit longer than normal. That's what she said. No time! Special note here too, one of the reasons I love doing this channel is to hear from y'all. So to help with that today, I'm going to put some comments out there about the various topics I talk about in this video. So feel free to comment, fight, argue, or just totally agree with all of my opinions. So this will be structured like my normal field guides, with the main difference being that the thought section might be a little shorter than normal. But she did no time! The deeper meaning will be a look at some of the arcs, as well as my best attempt at a concise message for this season. And the Dundies are my chance to talk about the best of the best. So with that, let's wrap up season three. No one uh, asked you anything ever. All right, so starting real high level here, season three, I think the first thing we have to talk about is the introduction of Ed Helms, Andy Bernard, and Rashida Jones, Karen Filippelli. While Karen was written as a whole season-wide arc, Ed Helms was never intended to actually last the entire season. As of September 2006, when Gay Witch Hunt aired, Helms was relatively unknown. He was a regular on The Daily Show for a bit, and he did some other side gigs before landing the role of Andy Bernard. The inclusion of Andy Bernard as a sole remaining member of the Stanford Branch merger plotline was always odd to me. I think I mentioned this before, but I never really saw him as a regular in the cast, even though he persists through each season from now until the end of the finale. In fact, in the finale, his closing remarks are so impactful that it made me question if I really missed the importance of his character. Andy's character is similar to Dwight. He's a plot device of a character. When they need him to be an antagonist, you get this. Um, am I happy about the way things turned out? When they needed him to be annoying, you get this. Ra -da 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 -do. <laughs> when you needed him to be uncomfortable, you get this. No, she's a part-time frozen yogurt chef. We'll get into Jones's Filippelli more during the deeper meaning, but I just want to say now that I think she killed it. She went on from here to Parks and Rec and then did a ton of stuff similar to Helms in both series and movies. It's probably worth mentioning here too that season three is when Justin Spitzer began to work on The Office. He was a writer, he was credited with both Back From Vacation and the Product Recall episodes. As a lead writer, he was also a story editor for several episodes and then later became a producer and even a showrunner for the show Superstore. A series that people keep telling me to watch and I keep not watching. I don't know, have you ever seen it? I don't care. And on that side of things, as The Office was increasing its popularity, the showrunners continued to get bigger and bigger guest directors to come on set. In my opinion, this is more about the show's credibility in the industry and not so much about the creative differences because most of them talked about how they didn't get a ton of creative freedoms. But seeing Harold Ramis, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant, Joss Whedon, and J.J. Abrams in the credits is really interesting. From now on, you guys are no longer losers. And that's probably a good segue to talk about some of my experience making these field guides over season three. I think there's been some cool highlights here and there. When I made the Gay Witch Hunt episode, I was under a ton of pressure to get that and the convention done as quickly as possible as I was going down for some surgery at that time. The Convict was the first episode I played with After Effects to cut out Prism Mike, making this Easter egg a thing in these videos. Since then, I played with Floating Andy, and I also put this one on TikTok, but most of you all haven't seen it yet, so here you go. Should have gone for the head. <laughs> No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 So follow my social accounts if you want more of that kind of stuff. In addition to Tom Chick, I was able to interview Andy Green, who wrote that book. And I also interviewed Nicholas D'Agusto. Also, season three is the first time most of you guys have seen me. So... Congratulations there. Oh. But the arcs are what I really want to talk about, so let's dive into the deeper meaning. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? This season is a juggling act of genius that I'm not even sure The Office, let alone anyone else, could ever fully recreate. Each episode has a reason to exist, 
a reason for the film crew to even be there. Whether it's the Diversity Day-esque gay witch hunt, or the drab paper convention, or the merging of the two branches, or Dwight's firing in return, and so on, there's no episode in this season that's wasted. What I think makes this season so special is in the writer's ability to juggle the over-the-top bits with the mundane lives of these paper company employees, doing so with these business and relational plot lines. So let's start with the big one, the plot line that's been around since the very first episode of season one. And that's downsizing. Because downsizing is a At a time in our economy when things were slowing down and downsizing was a consistent thought on anyone in the business world's mind, this consistent story loomed across the central themes of 35 episodes in the series. Themes like fear, expectations, motives, performance reviews, and inadequacies of management are all getting their time to shine in this season. Branch closing in the merger episodes wrap this arc in such an on-point manner, with Michael Scott lucking his way into the position. <sighs> we did it! Oh man! How did we do it? I don't have no idea. I don't understand. Throughout the next several episodes, we get to see the Stanford bunch dwindle down as it becomes obvious that Michael is too insecure, too dumb, and or too prideful to be a good leader. It's also in this season we get to see some sort of Stockholm Syndrome effect that's going on with his original group of employees. You're a good boss. You're a great boss. Also in season three, we have several hot topic social issues being spotlit like homosexuality, gay, good, race, why did the convict have to be a black guy, sexism, I'm saying that you're being sexist. No, I'm being misogynistic. And identity theft. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. And on top of that, we see the series spanning arc of Dwight's ambition to become regional manager realized and then taken away. His ambition led him to some dark places, both metaphorically and literally. Dwight rounds out this season with his hopes again dashed. But while Dwight's professional life is shaken during this season, his love life is stronger than ever for now. And it's in these relationship arcs that we get the real dramatic tension of this season. And that's of course the Jim, Pam, Karen love triangle. And what I love is that Karen is never played as the villain. She doesn't fall into any of the standard rom-com other girl tropes. She's sweet, she's smart, funny, competent, and a great partner for Jim overall. And that's what makes this arc actually have some tension. For the first time viewing, we're never really truly sure what Jim's gonna end up doing. And that's what's so great. All right, then it's a date. It's so good. And then there's this cool play on season two and season three arcs. Throughout season two, we follow Jim as he pines over an unavailable Pam as the camera and the narrative tends to follow Jim around and capture his emotions. And while reaction shots are consistent throughout the series, in the third season, we have a shift to the focus on Pam, pining over an unavailable Jim. It gives both of these characters an opportunity to grow as individuals who are good with who they are. And I think that's what the deeper meaning is. Look, this world is crazy. It is now, and it always has been. Michael Scott, from the point of view of his staff, is a play on the ineptitude of leadership in general. And though Dunder Mifflin Corporate has their ties on a little bit straighter than Michael, they're a play on the untrustworthiness of business, capitalism, corporate America, I don't really know what to call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Both Jim and Pam have these huge hurdles to leap in season three. Pam has to pursue and fight for what she wants. I often point to the Beach Games outburst as the moment where this is truly realized. But it does start in the gay witch hunt and is chipped at throughout the entire season. But Jim also has some growing to do throughout this season. Jim ran from the uncomfortable situation that is working side by side with the woman who rejected him. I don't have much commentary on that, but the timeline is suspect here. While he's flirty with Karen during the early Stanford arc, they don't actually begin to date until Jim's certain he has to go back to Scranton. I know that painting Jim out to be using Karen as a rebound from Pam is not putting him in his best light, but it's what he's doing. He said it himself. You just had a rebound, which don't get me wrong, can be a really fun distraction. But when it's over, you're left thinking about the girl you really like, one that broke your heart. So what kept him from jumping at Pam's coffee day proposal in the merger episode? I don't know, but my guess is pride. Throughout this season, we get glimpses that Jim is the holdout here. 
And it ultimately comes down to this moment on the beach when Pam, just like Jim in the previous season, puts it all out there. It's clear throughout the episode The Job that Jim is done running from all of this. But back to my main point, the world is unstable. Hey, you're unstable. Yeah. And if we look at these structures for stability, we're bound to crumble. Relationships work in the same way. We see the idea of codependence as a bad thing through Ryan and Kelly and Michael and Jan. So the deeper meaning here is that the world sucks and a lot of relationships suck. But if you want something good, be confident in yourself. Know what you want, pursue it, just like Ryan. You and I are done. What? But that's just what I think about season three's deeper meaning. Tell me in the comments what you think the deeper meaning is. With that, let's dish out some dundies. And then I gotta get him to the dundies. And this is the time that I've been dreading for the last several weeks. Choosing between anything as the best in this season is really difficult, but that's what I'm here to do. If you disagree, leave it in the comments. Uh, let's start with maybe the hardest thing for me to decide, so instead I had you decide it. What is the best bit in season three? A season that I'll remind you has some of the best bits in the entire series. Rather than just do the award show type thing that I've done in the last few of these, I'm just gonna do a countdown. All right, so number five, we have the delight that is pretzel day. And then I go to work to a job for which I get paid too little. But on pretzel day, well, I like pretzel day. This bit is so memorable. It's consistently one of the top non-Michael Scott related merch topics I see out there. There's something so relatable to Stanley's affection with Pretzel Day 2. I think that's why it earned its spot here. All right, thank you. Number four, Dwight's coup failure. I know, I know. You know what? Jan called me about your little meeting. No, I know. This is, and will probably always be, one of my favorite scenes featuring both Dwight and Michael. Please, I'll do your laundry for a month, I for a year! I have Michael. a laundry machine. Number three, the improvised gay witch hunt kiss. I did it. Iconic. Made all the more better knowing that it was improvised and everyone's reaction to it has a gleam of realism in it. Thank you. See, I'm still here. We're all still here. And number two. Depression? Isn't that just a fancy word for feeling bummed out? Dwight, you ignorant slut. I don't really get this one, to be honest with you. I don't know if it's that this bit is so popular because it was repeated in the episode. Dwight, you ignorant slut! Or because it's been repeated so much online. But it's become one of the most iconic quotes of the series. Even though it's really an SNL quote, but I digress. And before we get to number one, some honorable missions here are Gaydar, Diwali Song, How to Prepare a Goose, and Michael's Apology Tape. And the number one bit from season three, as voted by y'all, is of course, Prison Mike. I'm Prison Mike. You know why they call me Prison Mike? It doesn't matter what the product is, slap a Prison Mike on there and it's gonna be a bestseller. This bit was so unexpected, so over the top, so Michael Scott that it deserves its place on the top of this list. Thanks. And I'm gonna have to speed through these next two categories. So first up, most cringeworthy moments of season three. Number five, Ben Franklin hitting on Pam. Yes, but I don't. <laughs> My name is Gordon. Oh. Number four, Michael's failed kiss attempt. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm I rejecting your what? kiss. I didn't. Number three, Michael's failed proposal. I would like you to do me the honor of making me your husband. Number two, Michael Scott announcing at Phyllis's wedding. For the first time as a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Vance. That one gets me every time. But I'm gonna give the top one, the most cringe inducing moment of season three to Scott's schooling. You cannot learn from books. There's just something so awful, 
so slow and just methodical about this segment. And that's why it earned my top spot. So suck on that! So before we get to the big ones, the best episode and the best cold opening, here's some of the best unexplained mysteries from season three. First up, did Dwight ever figure out that Jim wasn't a vampire? I mean, how did that conversation go? Dwight was pretty close to stabbing the guy with a broom. Next up is an often speculated affair. Did Roy and Angela have a thing? I don't think so. Moving on. Who was Toby's date at Phyllis's wedding? We never see her again in the series, and in fact, I spent a little while trying to figure out who this actress even was, and I couldn't figure it out, so the mystery even goes deep in real life. Moving on, was Ed Truck actually decapitated? Creed is shown as a compulsive liar throughout the entire series, so I have no idea if what he says here is true. It seems like something Jan could have cleared up in a jiffy. And lastly, while we're on Creed, who's he paying to use the women's room? My bet is either Meredith or Phyllis. I don't trust you, Phyllis. But back on track, the best cold opening. Number five, letters from the future. Before I left, I took a box of Dwight's stationery. So from time to time, I send Dwight faxes from himself, from the future. It's a great bit, well executed, so much fun. No! You'll thank me later. And I'd love to hear how this conversation went after the camera's cut. So number four, when Roy attacks, the negotiation. Sounds good. Hey, helper! Right! Ah! Right! Ah! Ah! It's not funny per se, but it is impactful. Pun. But it does make me laugh at the end every single time. Well, who's laughing now? Number three, Pavlov's Dwight. In school, we learned about this scientist who trained dogs to salivate at the sound of a bell by feeding them whenever a bell rang. I can still recall the first time watching this cold opening and reveling in the pure joy of their shenanigans. What are you doing? My mouth tastes so bad all of a sudden. Number two, demerits. And I also have lots of questions, like what does a demerit mean? Dwight is 100% Dwight in this one, and Jim is 100% Jim, and I'm 100% in. Full desagulation. What's a dis... what's that? Oh, you don't want to know. It's one of the best cold openings of season three, but the very best has to go to identity theft. It's kind of blurry. That's better. And that may not be a surprise because it's often on the list of one of the most iconic cold openings throughout the entire series. Michael! Oh, that's funny. Michael! But that leads us into the big one, the best episode of season three. And this is where I'm gonna get myself into a little bit of trouble. Call it a cop out if you want. Instead of ranking these, I'm just gonna lay out what I think are the best episodes categorically. First up, the funniest episode of season three is Gay Witch Hunt. Yeah, I know. No, he's attracted to other men. Okay, a little too far, cross the line. That's ridiculous. Yeah, probably. He didn't tell the truth a lot. Let's call him, get the website, definitely. The laughs are nonstop, the kiss is incredible, and from start to finish, this episode is amazingly funny. It's also what you people voted as the best episode of season three. All right, so the most inspirational episode of season three goes to Beach Games. There's something about the ceiling that Michael and the rest of the staff put on Pam, and seeing her break through it is just one of the best episodes of the series for me. Pam, that was amazing. But I am still looking for someone with a sales background. And I'm gonna give business school and safety training honorable missions here as well. Business school is the office in a bottle. It has everything the office should have. Laughs, cringe, and heart. I am really proud of you. Safety training has this. Dwight, you ignorant slut! And for some reason, everybody seems to love this episode because of that. But the best episode of season three is The Job. The Job. The Job. Through this job. Boob job. It's a great episode, expertly written, shot, acted, and edited. 
The tension and the payoff at the conclusion are amazing, and it juggles even more than a typical episode of The Office has to, with the extremely difficult job of wrapping up the season's arcs and also setting up season four. And I might not laugh uncontrollably during this episode, but it is one of the top episodes that come to mind every time I think about season three. That's because you're a preppy freak, you're the office pariah, and nobody likes you. But that's just what I think about season three. What do you think? Leave it in the comments. I want to know what you have to say. That's all I have for season three. Next week, join us for the start of season four, which might sound normal. And if that does, welcome to my channel. If you've been around for a while, then you know I've already done season four, but this is going to give me a chance to remaster it. Next week, we should be looking at Fun Run. Probably also expect a channel update in the next week or so. Thank you so much for watching and like, subscribe, comment, do all that stuff. It helps me out and we'll see you next time.